Welcome, friends. We are about to get started. My name is Reverend Allison Lanza, and I am one of the pastors at Ridgely Christian Church, and we are thrilled that you have joined us tonight for the third night in our Facebook Live series, Faith in a Time of Chaos. And then is that more true even now than it was when we began this three weeks ago? Our world is in chaos right now. Things are being shown in this time, in the last few weeks, in the last few months, things are being revealed, things that have been broken for a long time, but we are beginning to see those things now. And so we wanted to invite some of the most faithful, most justice-seeking people we know to come and join us and to guide us, to help us think through, what does it mean? What does it look like to be faithful people today? right now here in our world where is god calling us and so tonight i am thrilled to introduce you most of you already know who are joining us to the amazing pastor law reverend brazola law she is one of the pastors at northway christian church in dallas more than that she is a prophetic leader in our church and a guide in our church and a friend and a guide to me and so i am so grateful that she will get to be our guide tonight um, welcome, Pastor Law. Welcome, Virgie. We're glad you're here. Hey, y'all. <laughs> We're going to start tonight by just having you tell us a little bit more about yourself. Who are you? What do you do in this world? I am the daughter of those who were forced to come to the shores of the United States of America. 401 years ago, by way now of centuries later, Thomas and Virginia Law, born in the coastal waters near Cedar Lake, Texas, close to Bay City and around those shores, some of the last shores in these yet to be United States that knew that Black people were free. So we celebrate Juneteenth. I am the daughter of those who were some of the last to find out that Black folk were free. 18 months later, we discovered this. But 401 years, that daughter. I am the mother of Jasmine Williams, young adult with two of the most precious gifts I've ever received, Ava, three-year-old, and Aiden, tomorrow will be eight weeks old. Wow. A Black girl and black boy, black girl full of fire, black boy full of wonder already to bring change to the world. I am the sister of two black men, one seven years older, another three years younger, who gave me two wonderful sister in loves, three young adult black nephews who now have their own families, who also then the younger brother brought me two other black boys and a fiery girl. That's who I am first and foremost. I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm an auntie. I'm a friend of many, an enemy of few. <laughs> I am a pastor, I'm a prophet, I'm a preacher, I'm a poet, and I'm a person who occupies the role as senior minister of Northway Christian Church, a 103-year-old church in the Park Cities area of Dallas, Texas. I am the first one who is as beautiful and who has been kissed by the sun as long as I have to serve in such a role. Previous to this, I served in a church 175 years old, now 176, in the southern city of Memphis, Tennessee, the same place where Martin Luther King was murdered on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel, April 4th, 1968. I was born five years later to the date and served in the senior minister of another historic congregation of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And before then, another historic church, African-American church, Mississippi Boulevard, I served as associate pastor for 12.5 years. And before then, I served two other churches. And so I am all of that. And I am mad. And I'm angry. And I'm exhausted. And I'm hopeful. 
and I'm following the Pentecostal winds. That's who I am right now. now if you ask me tomorrow, <laughs> sleep. But right now, that's who I am. Amen. You mentioned a little bit, but tell us more about your passions. My passions is change. Uh, I am not an Enneagram. I am suspect of Enneagram, of Myers-Briggs. I am suspect of Strength Finder, of DISC, of Emergenetics, because they did not have Black people in mind as they have been handed down this information uh, and how it's been appro culturally appropriated. And so um, I'm an eight, so I'm a challenger, and I'm passionate about challenging people to be their better selves, to cultivate a wholeness. I'm passionate about a beloved community that is not yet, but shall be. I'm passionate about being a prophet, uh, one who looks over the shoulders of God, the Reverend Valerie Bridgman says, to see the world not as it is, but as it ought to be, and call the world as it is, as it ought to be. Amen. That's my passion. Um, and so sometimes that is just some girlfriends around the table. What, who ought we be? Uh, sometimes that's my little uh, three-year, who ought we be? And sometimes uh, that is me working hard, exhausted. Who, where ought I be on the island in Jamaica? So the oughtness, uh, peeping over God's shoulder, yeah. imagining a world. So my passion is imagination and then calling people and challenging people to be that. So they call, they say I'm an eight on the Enneagram for those who follow that. And others, uh, other places, they don't know where to place me. So I just show up um, and then let the world fall um, in the passion and challenge of life. Uh, but beloved community, beloved community is my passion. And you live it out and you help create that, that imagined world, that world of God that is coming and, and about to be and just on the horizon. You help put that into place and lead with us, lead us with the spirit to there more than most I know. And I am so grateful you are leading the way. So thank you for that. Where are you going for inspiration these days? What's inspiring you? What, what books, what stories in our scripture, what podcasts, what shows, what people, what's, what's inspiring you? What's drawing you? So I would say I hang out in the prophets. Um, I hang out with, with Jeremiah. I hang out in Ruth. I hang out in Isaiah. I spend time weekly in the Psalms. Um, because it's the song of the heart, uh, the, the, the color book of life, uh, if you will. And so the Psalms also are singing my beat. I, I hang out uh, with the prophets a lot. Um, I dip in the New Testament uh, weekly because that's just my groundedness, looking for the good news of Jesus Christ. And so uh, that, that's kind of where I hang out. Um, and if I don't, I'm not my best self. So God pulls me back there. I have been spending time a lot with Thurman, the great mystic Howard Thurman, the Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman. Um, I've been reclaiming my womanist roots in, in new ways. Uh, so I've been reading uh, persons like the Reverend Dr. Ebony Thurman and uh, Marshall Thurman. I've been reading back and reading new ones. And so I've been reaching back now to the uh, Dr. Reverend uh, Katie Geneva uh, Cannon um, and Dolores Williams, reaching back to my 1990s roots of reading the womanist theologians who um, the Reverend Dr. Renita Weems. Uh, so it's, she's kind of back when I first started in the 90s and hearing them. So uh, been, I've been going to the places where black women are gathering to breathe because our breath is taken away, making sure that black boys and black girls can breathe. And then if we're breathing, then I'm checking on all the folks because our pastor are predominantly a white church and we have in our church also a Latina church. So I'm trying to make sure all the people are breathing. So I kind of go to places where I know I can catch breath and that's uh, in black womanist spaces. So Zooms is where I'm spending a lot of my time. <laughs> so I'm reading those books. I'm reading the poets and listening to jazz because the improvisation of jazz just feeds me a uh, neo soul. Uh, so that's where my inspiration, and I'm listening to all kinds of podcasts, some very inappropriate <laughs> to listen to and others that are quite substantive. And right now I'm chasing some work around the great influenza. I think it's mm -hmm. just Barry is his name, but looking at all that happened, uh, there was not much happening in science and medicine before then. And so, so much happened quickly after then. So the hope that that uh, brings me for this moment, like what is about to happen? We don't have any imagination. So I'm looking at science, 
The future is coming faster than you think. It's another one I'm reading. Um, Canoeing Mountains is another one, just looking at another way to navigate the terrain. So I'm all over the place. I'm in science, I'm in law, I'm in medicine. I am, of course, in faith, but really steep in the Bible. And I'm reading my friends and my family, looking at them, reading their wrinkles mm -hmm. at the graying of America because we can't get to the beauty shop. I'm reading people's faces closer than I ever have because we're staring at each other. So I think I'm reading people, uh -huh, the beloved. Yeah. Thank you for that. And Thanks those for of you answer. listening, we will get a list of some of those sources she mentioned. If you want to read along, read along with the pastor. If you want to read along beside her, we'll get those listed in the comments for you and share those with you. And also some links so you can learn more about womenist theology if that is a new a new idea for you and read some of those um, those scholars and those theologians and those pastors who are leading us in powerful and new ways. What do you see as the role in the church? Of, of the role of the church right now in this time and a time of a pandemic and a time when we are looking again, looking anew, some looking for the first time at the racist history and the racist present of our country and finding our new way, that new imagination. What's the role of the church? Where should we be right now? Where the winds blow. It's Pentecost season. Uh, for a disciple, uh, I'm saying it's time for us to be Pentecostal. <laughs> time to listen to the winds and the languages that are different than languages we think, not just the idiomatic, not just the languages of people spoken dialect, but the languages, the cries, the screams, the screeches, the cussing, the, the challenges, the joy, the little ones, the older ones aching just to be community, to show up with each other, listening to the languages so that when we all come together in one place in this ways and the pandemic is global, listening across the lands beyond our narrow view of our singular churches and the edifices in which we have worshiped more than we worship the God, right? The Jesus the, of this, who we are as the body of Christ. So um, I would say uh, uh, listening to the languages, the Pentecostal winds uh, that are blowing and uh, in ways that we could have never imagined. And as we listen to then respond, to pray, to listen some more and respond, to be that church, to devote themselves, Acts 2 says to the apostles teaching the breaking of bread into giving mm -hmm. as they have need and to refuse to go back the same way we came. Don't waste this pandemic. That's what I want to tell the church. That's and it's the time. Don't waste the pandemic. That's a good word we need to hear. I think so many of us have been saying and I've been hearing in circles of we'll just wait till this is over. When this is over, we'll go back to being the church. But I don't I think we're, you're right. We're the church now. And this is a time we have been given. And this is a time we can use and we we cannot waste this and see what the spirit's doing in it. So I'm not going back. I've told my church I'm not going back. So if they want the normal, the old normal, then I need to find a new church to serve. If anybody wants me to show up, I want to be thinner. I want to be more joyful. I want to be more passionate. I want to waste time on stupid, less time on stupid stuff. We're going to have to waste time, but on less time on stupid stuff. It's too much at stake. I feel a sense of urgency. So I don't want a new normal. I want a better normal for everybody, but particularly for those who the new normal particularly African-Americans who have built this country. We are built on our backs and then it oppressed us and is crushing us to the point that we now have watched over and over again, a white police policeman put his knees on the neck and take the breath of a black man and then to get an autopsy report to say with some other underlying conditions. Well, we had a pandemic before this pandemic. Racism is a pandemic. Sexism is a pandemic. Heterosexism is a, we've been in some pandemics. So now we're all in this pandemic together. I don't want to go back to normal. I don't even want a new normal based on some other kind of person's construct that's been co-opted by colonialism. I want a better normal, more like the one God created at the beginning and called it good. Yeah. 
I can't wait for that new normal. Me either. <laughs> what word of challenge do you have for us? For people today, folks who are gathered here listening with us right now, who want to be faithful, who want to follow the spirit, who want to follow God's call, what's your word of challenge for us? Where, what does that look like? Where do we go? What does it mean to be faithful people today? Change. Change the way you change. Hmm. Stop resisting change. We have pivoted on a dime. We have done things we never imagined we would do. So go ahead and change. What is the one area that you need to change? And then go to the next area and the next step and breathe. I'm wearing this Selah shirt. Just saying, breathe. Selah, breathe. And then change again. Like every new morning, a new mercy, Lamentation says, it is because of the Lord's anger. We're not even consumed. Great is God's faithfulness. Let's move into the new mercies and change. With the seasons, there's change. And our, we're, in, we're about to move into summer, waiting for autumn, then the winter and spring. We change with the season, so we might as well change. Culture is changing. And there are so, I was spending Sunday after Pentecost. I'm exhausted. I got this text. Clergy are meeting here. Then we're meeting here. And I was all over the city of Dallas. And I ended up being one of the few clergy with a group of young adults at the Freedman Cemetery here in Dallas, Texas. And all of a sudden, I'm being called ma'am. And these young adults are like, can I help you? Can you have a seat? Because I'm on the clergy collar. And I'm thinking I'm pretty young. But watching various hues and nationalities and ableism come together for someone they didn't know, for a system that they want to see change, gave me a sense of urgency and a call that we all need to change and stop resisting the change. So... I would say that um, that's the word I would give us, um, the word of challenge to change, to change the way we understand the world, to become more culturally intelligent. That is, we we chase intellect, we chase all of these, uh, we chase capitalism and to get a bigger house, to get a bigger pool, to get a bigger car, to be bigger, to be faster, only to get older and to try to downsize. So let's go on and change all the things now so that we know there really is enough for all. Amen. And so if we can change our mindsets and change our hearts, we can change the world. So that's my word. Let's change. Amen. Well, and you're right. We, you do. If you had told the church in January that every church would move to digital and have an online presence and, and know how to, they would have said there's no way. And so we've shown as a church, we can change. And so if we can change that, why can't we change systemic racism? Why can't we change our culture? Why can't we change all the things that oppress people? We can do that on a dime. We can do any of it on a dime. And those things are worth way more than, than online worship. I mean, it is amazing. I keep telling my church, 113 years, I'm so proud of them that they've changed that. And now they're committed to changing. We are moving to becoming an uh, anti-racist church and to really do that with great intentionality, like just calling a black pastor is not enough. Um, and so we are committing to doing that work together. And so early today, I talked with a group of people who are working. Um, and so we're gonna change the way we're approaching our adult Sunday school um, hour. Um, in August, we come together for a forum. So the leaders are gonna be trained in June and July on anti-racism work. And then we're gonna do that work together at some point every week in the month of August and then look for steps forward. So that's the vision. It really is to say to become more culturally aware to see in our own hearts where there's racism in our own hearts where the systems of oppression oppress others and how we contribute to that. And then if we did it, we can undo it. Mm -hmm. If we've been participants of it, if we have privilege from it, how then we might redistribute that wealth and redistribute our, our understanding of what is wrong so we can right those wrongs and make them right. What better place for that birth and what better place for that change to happen in the church? So I'm excited about those who came on a Zoom call not knowing what the pastor was gonna say. And when I say race matters, that is we're one human race, but there are matters of race that we need to deal with and deal with honestly and earnestly with Jesus at the center, with the gospel message of good news for all at the center. So we can hear Luke quote Isaiah again, to, to, to hear that the oppressed should go free, 
that recovery of sight to the blind, the lame will walk, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord Savior. We've been anointed to do that, right? So um, I'm excited about a church. I think I'm more excited about the church than I've ever been excited in Northway has said yes. And some of them don't know they say yes, they might be hearing it for the first time. <laughs> but they're saying yes, because that's our work right now. We're looking at what does it mean to say yes, what it means to live yes, and what it means to bridge to the yeses of the call of Jesus Christ in our life, to put Jesus back at the center of it and to say nothing else even matters. That this gospel message, this good news is for all. And so I would say that uh that, 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 that's my challenge. That's my excitement. Um, that's what, what I'm believing God for at the church. I've got new hope for the church. I'm ready. <laughs> if we have, we can lead all our churches to commit to being anti-racist churches in this moment. Mm -hmm. And if when we come back together, gathered in buildings at some point, we come back with that, that knowledge and that passion and that fire to, to live that gospel message. What a, what a change this, the church can be. That's and I'm really you. hoping that this doesn't just become Northway. So one of the members said, oh, it just, I just like the vision start taking off. And I was like, whoa, he said, pastor, I hope this is just not for Northway. I hope we will invite this to other churches. I hope we can find an hour or a day of the week that other churches can be a participant. And if we can't do it in person, or if we do a hybrid of Zoom and that, then we can break into Zoom rooms and we can learn and share these honest conversations. Yes. So That's I was like, up. you got your first church to join with Northway. I, I looked at my executive pastor and the other pastor on the call. I was like, y'all, I think we're going to do this differently. So like, like you, you know how they say you <laughs> build the plane or you fix the plane as you're flying it. So you all are hearing it live and we have more calls to make. So if they tell me that, um, well, praise God, there are enough who are excited about it that uh, we, we really are. And right now we're just, it came out of prayer. Amen. been praying every noon day it came out of prayer our our elders started praying in october at 6 30 a.m every tuesday we just pray we're praying on uh, the book of common prayer for ordinary radicals and so we've been praying 6 30 a.m i'm not a morning person so i know god told me to, when that happened 6 30 <laughs> every tuesday we're praying the elders are praying and i'm not praying I'm just listening to the prayers and we're hearing the prayers of people and following the liturgy. So we move from there to then at the Lenten season, we invite the congregation every Tuesday to pray. And Monday through Friday, we're praying at noon. And so now that we're starting to move through a few of the phases, we're outside in the parking lot inviting people to just come pray. And Northway is uh, a Northwest Highway in Dallas, Texas, some of the uh, richest real estate in Dallas. And so people are looking to say, why are these folk outside? Do they know there's looting in the street? Do they know North Park Mall is closed? But the church is not closed. The building is closed. So, so we can be outside social distance and we're just praying on Northwest Highway as a representative of outside beyond Sunday, beyond the building to pray to see what God will do. And so this vision of uh, becoming an anti-racist church um, with intentionality because people mean to not be racist, right? No one's trying to be, but the intentionality to become that, to live into this beloved community, um, we're moving into that vision and we're gonna do it with education and then see what normal programs and steps and vision comes from that earnest place individually and communally. And then that's beyond Northways. So we welcome other churches to join us uh, and we'll max out the Zoom and figure out what platform so we can do that work virtually in person together, I'm believing God for change. So I ain't playing, I'm coming for it. We coming. We're coming with you, we're ready. There are other intersections that we will face and we can see this beloved creation that God gave his son, right? So that we can have life, that the very God of the universe, of all of creation, she birthed something amazing. Amen. She birthed the creation and so, uh, we're following Christ and believing the Holy Spirit for this Pentecostal win. Don't get me started. Keep going. What's your name? I love it. <laughs> and those of you who missed it, they've been praying the Book of Common Prayer for Ordinary Radicals. And we'll post a link for that, too, if you want to pray alongside. And I think that's a good word you said, that if it's not, you all didn't start praying when crisis hit, when the pandemic hit. You've been praying each and every week consistently, and that's what we're called to as faithful people. We don't just pray in times of crisis and in times of great joy. We pray and go to God every day. 
and listen for where God's spirit is moving and where God is calling us. And we don't just pray alone, that we pray together in community because that's how we can, that's how we hear God and see God often is in each other and in the insights each other give. And so thank, thank you for that good word. And that that's a spiritual discipline that I think many of our churches and, and our faithful people have have lost. We, uh, we intend to pray. We've been meaning to be leaning on God. It's one of my favorite songs, but we, but we forget. And so when we have that intentional discipline, that's when we, that's how we get ready to change so that when, when a pandemic hits, um, when the pandemics that have been here forever get shown again, we're ready and we are already built up in God and listening to the spirit and know how to respond. And so thank you for that reminder to the church. You know, First Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17, rejoice in the Lord again and again. Uh, always, I say again, rejoice and pray without ceasing for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. And so it is without ceasing and that we miss sometimes. And I tell you, when my alarm goes off every Tuesday, I'm like, who is that? What happened? I'm like, oh my God, I got to get up and pray. And no one's watching. It's a conference call. So you just come on your pajamas and we pray. Uh, and there's times we pray in person and of course our Sundays, but uh, it is the great, is the hymn of the church. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. So, um, yeah, praying. That's the root of it. That's the heart of it. It's the listening. So it's not even as much as the talking. It's really sometimes just the stillness with two or three are gathered and to see what God is revealing. God is still speaking. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. You've talked a lot about that beloved community that is coming, that is soon and very soon. And tell us more. You've been peeking over God's shoulder. You've been looking over her shoulder. What do you see in your best and sweetest dreams of what this world might be, what our communities might be? What do you see? What does it look like? What will this new world that emerges be? That's I still believe the church is the hope of the world. I still believe the church is where it's at. Um, there's a song that we were singing at a general assembly that I just love. I think Bill Thomas is part of the authorship of it, but I see a church with a vision. I see a church with on a mission. I see the church with its doors open wide where the poor and the rich worship God side by side. I see a church with those who are different don't have to hide. I see a church um, building its hopes on things eternal, holding to God's unchanging hands. If I was in the black church, I was like, hold to his hands, God's unchanging hands, build your hopes. Yeah. So the eternal promises, the stuff that I want for my grandbabies and my daughter, I'm thinking you want for your son. Amen. I'm thinking others want for their children and their mothers and their grandmothers and the children yet unborn. So building that beloved community, not just for me, right? But for all of those who want the same things. But when we are building our systems, particularly an educational system and a prison system based on a child's second and third grade reading level, and we're not doing anything about it in pre-K, and we're not giving them enough healthy food in this food desert, and they don't have enough access to health care. And I mean, the list, right? And so then you have a pandemic that puts all of this on top of the disenfranchisement. So I'm peeping over God's shoulders, and God is saying, enough is enough. And so over the balcony of heaven i just imagine god say i'm gonna let y'all handle it and i'm gonna work it together for the good so as i see the icebergs you know come and split at a faster rate because we've pushed in the earth as i see the kind of challenges that people of color are having as i watch our elderly being shut off from their families as i as a pastor, have been at the graveside and in funeral homes where we've had to choose nine people so that one person can be the pastor. Mm -hmm. Or some bodies you can't see because they had COVID and they've been, and others you do see. And then you're watching, like, as I watch this and people can't say, but like, God ain't playing with us. God has said, I will see. You say, how long? Y'all think y'all got this. And God is new mercy, new morning. 
ever so patiently. For a day in God's sight is but a thousand years and a half. It's just a day to God. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. They're too vast for us. But it breaks God's heart. How do you know? Because we see it on the cross. We see when Jesus say, at the Garden of Gethsemane, can you let this pass for me? We see Jesus on the cross saying, why have you forsaken me, God? So we see what breaks God's heart. And yet God still continues to intervene. And I know that because we're not consumed. The numbers are rising, but yet there are things that we can do both in this pandemic that is the medical health pandemic, the financial pandemic we're facing, the humanitarian crisis we will face, the church challenges we will face, and the pandemic of racism and sexism and all of the other pandemics that's breaking human hearts, is breaking the very heart of God. And so I'm looking over God's shoulders and I'm saying, I'm gonna do my part and I hope you, beloved, will do yours. Because together, this kingdom that's at hand, this realm, this community of God is at hand, God has no hands but our hands, no feet but our feet, no mouthpiece but our mouthpiece to do this work. So I'm in it. I'm in it with you. We in this together. Amen. Mm-hmm. What word of encouragement do you have for us? As we, how do we find, you've told us lots of ways that where do we find the strength of God? Where, how do we listen to the spirit? What's your word of encouragement for us faithful people who are, are seeking that new world, but we are weary and exhausted? and we angry and anxious. What, what word of encouragement do you have for us today? I was asking God that yesterday because I'm exhausted, I'm tired. I have bags under my eyes. Some days I don't put the cover up on like, how you feel pastor? You see these bags, they're real. That's what I usually say in the Zoom. I, these are real. Cause even I go to bed crying, I wake up crying. It's nothing like these last seven days talking to black mothers, it's just been hard. And I find myself just watching as we wait for children to come home, as we protest, as the challenges of Black Life Matters and having to, to explain why we're saying Black Lives Matter is not that all lives don't matter, they do. But if your house is on fire, the whole neighborhood matters. But that house is on fire is where the fire department is going. Mm-hmm. My body, my whole body matters. But when I got diagnosed with diabetes, they checked my heart, they checked other stuff, but they look at that sugar, right? So as we look at all the systems, we're saying Black Lives Matter because that's the group of people that have experienced the most oppression because this is the group who was forced to come 401 years ago. This is the group that the systems have been built against. So it's not that all lives don't matter, but right now up and through here, Black Lives Matter, y'all. And so my encouragement to you, to us who are in this work of justice, who are making sure that a beloved uh, can be for all, and all means y'all, I'm from Texas, all y'all, y'all, it is Galatians 6, don't get weary in doing, doing well. For if you don't think there will be a harvest in due season, don't get tired. Children don't get weary. Children don't get weary. Children don't get weary until your work is done. Mm. But take a nap. Get a sailor. Go walk. Watch some kids play in the pool. You go in the pool. I mean, like, take a real nap in the middle of the day. Because you're not doing good work anyway if you're just pressing through, right? Find some sailor. Find some rest, find some joy. I talked about joy's resistance. And when I heard that from an activist and found out joy was resistance, they're like, well, why are you smiling and you upset? I'm like, I just, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I can't explain it. Mm -hmm. I will get upset. And if I don't get my rest, I'll cuss you out. And that doesn't, you know, show the best part of me. So I got to rest. I got to find times for recreation. I got to find times to be in relationship with my friends. I binge watched a uh, eight series, um, uh, Little Fires Everywhere. I binge watched that. Uh, I watched that, that one too. 
the we had Senior Sunday here at Northway, and the, the our family uh, pastor and uh, family and, and ministry youth pastor. Uh, he was preaching, and so was our seniors, and so was Youth Sunday. And so all I had to do was do a prayer and do some other piece. I binge watch y'all for nine hours. It was wonderful. It was highly redemptive. So say love, read. Um, so that is my word of you. Don't get weary until your work is done. Find the ways and spaces that bring life. And because, again, the breath of one was taken, premature. Breathe for him. Breathe life into others. And because none of us are flying that much right now, put your oxygen mask on and breathe so that you might bring breath to others. So say lies, my word of encouragement. Don't get weary. Say lie. And then get up and work. I love that. And I love that the joy is an act of resistance. I think when that's a gift the church can bring to our world that that goes first and tends to stay in cynicism and despair. And if we can be the ones that can can see that better way, we can know that even while it's breaking now that God's beloved community is coming and that is joy that we know we are working towards that God has not given up on us and will not give up on us. And so I, I love that word. That is a good word of hope. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it some, but what's giving you life these days? <laughs> I, I would say uh, Zoom calls with some friends, uh, the ways in which we're finding, uh, we call them happy hours, bring a beverage that you can drink slowly. It can be tea, coffee, bourbon, wine. Uh, it can be a mixed drink. It could be water that's too cold that you need, to, or hot water, just things that you have to sip slowly. We call those our happy hours. Um, I would also say walks with my granddaughter and now my nephew's in town, my great nephew, and just little people and their scavenger hunts of picking up rocks and wanting to talk to dogs and not knowing how to do social, I don't like to say social distance, so not how to practice physical distance. They are just wanting to connect and talk. And so just making sure that I'm connecting with another generation and stopping at my neighbors and waving at my older neighbors. That's just bringing me a great bit of life and joy. So Zoom calls, happy hours with friends. My family, we're doing it on Fridays. We have talent shows. Um, and so we, we're connecting with my family from a different cities. And it's a bunch of fun. Uh, uh, and we just, I mean, normally we just see each other holidays, but it's been about it every other week, Friday. And so... Um, my brother's kids, especially my younger brother's kids, they are a hoot. So they have costumes and they go in the other room and they come back. And <laughs> it, is, it is just actually bringing us life. And my parents are in their 80s and they're going to celebrate 60 years of Black love. I like to say 60 years of Black love because you don't get to talk about long marriages and you don't get to really celebrate. But and particularly African Americans, when you add racism and all the challenges that come with that, those statistics go up uh, in terms of divorce and down in terms of keeping the covenant. So my parents have been married 60 years. My mom's coming to stay with me for this month because she wanted to be with the new grandbaby. So once she quarantined herself, she was able to come when he was four weeks old. And so the way they're going to get to 60 is because my mom came to stay with us. And so July 17th, <laughs> I have 60 years. So that gives me life, watching love persist in the midst of pandemic, in the midst of chaos. Uh, watching other love, praying, praying for the love that will come my way one day. But now sister can't even date. I mean, I can't date because I'm a pastor. Already. But now you really can't date because we in pandemic and quarantine. I'm with you. The struggle is real. The struggle is real. Can I just have a, a, a coffee with somebody? Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, a Zoom date is not the same. <laughs> but the life, just watching life happen in the midst of, in spite of what's happening seeing love, seeing a joy, seeing how we tears. One of my dear friends had a baby. I don't know if she wants this public, so I won't say her name, but one of my dear clergy friends had a baby and on Zoom for a little bit with the clergy interfaith group that I have, and she nursed her baby girl in front of us, and it just brought life, uh, and we just felt so privileged because it was her first day home, right? So, the pictures we're exchanging with each other, um, the walks, it's, it's, it's life. Uh, I think Jeremiah talks about plant where you are in the midst of pandemic, just plant, start planting. I'm not a gardener, but my mama right now, she's 
she planted some stuff. I hope it lives when she go home this weekend. I hope it lives. Somebody watered those plants. But she's planting in my house. And so I hope to be able to keep up with what my mom has done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, but. I just said, that's life. That's life. Just exchanging love with one another is life. You're right. We've been connecting more in this time of social distancing. I feel more connected to my neighbors, the people I'm walking by and seeing, to people I'm talking to on, on Zoom and on Facebook and connecting with who I could have been connecting with all this time, all the time, and I haven't. And so I think there's, we've made those connections and I hope that's a piece we do not lose that we've, we've connected in that way. If you are watching us on Facebook Live, I see there's a whole lot of you all and um, we're here on Zoom and you have questions for Pastor Law. If you want to write those in the comments or put those in the chat here on Zoom, if you're joining us on Zoom, um, do that and we'll try to get those answered. Um, and our uh, Mark and Catherine who are helping us moderate those, if you see cat questions, if you'll let us know, know what you see. You know, uh, Pastor, there's this one question I wanna have. If yeah. So I have a staff, and again, I serve a mostly white church, and my staff is mostly white. A few uh, persons of color uh, have someone um, who is of Indian background, Indian American. Uh, on my staff, I have an African American on my staff, but most, and I have a Latina on my staff, but most of my staff is white. And so we've been trying to figure out how does this work? How do we get this online platform working and moving? And they said, well, Pastor, we got to keep it under hours. Like, well, yeah, I mean, we've been having that argument, that conversation. We have the contemporary traditional conversation, but we're looking for new ways to have conversation about worship because it's more than that. It's what brings meaning, what brings purpose, what brings transformation, what are the values that support that? So we're going on retreat virtually and try to figure that out. And they said, we have to keep it in an hour. So because we, as we watch churches, we see that most of the churches are keeping it under an hour. And I said, that's interesting. Churches I watch have about an hour and a half to hour and 45 minutes. So I don't know which churches you're watching. Help me understand. I think we need to change the way we talk about church. Are we talking about white evangelical church? We're talking about white church. We're talking about high church, low church, contemporary church. Like what church are we talking about? And so I do appreciate our sense of understanding the cultural sensitivity that people's attention spans and all of that good stuff. But I want to help the beloved community know that there's more than a monolithic church. Mm -hmm not just talking about denominationalism. There's one more than one way to be church, more than one way to be faith. And that's a whole nother topic, right? But if we're talking about at least what it means to be Christian church, we don't even realize we're not creating space to think about the various hues, the various expressions, even within each denomination or non-denomination and what it means to be church. And so I've had the privilege of deeply being rooted in the African-American church, deeply rooted in the white church. And now I'm just trying to build a church where whosoever will, let them come. And to honor the traditions of each of those churches. I'm not trying to make a uniform church, but to say that when we say church, as we move forward, put the qualifier yeah. as a whole church. It is the church. Christian church, particularly in the United States of America, that Christians, Protestants in particular, are notwithstanding, not with, notwithstanding the Catholic church and other ways that people show up in Christian faith, but, but Protestant church, the black church, right? That was where education took place. That's how folk didn't go and kill all these slave masters. I mean, the church tempered the black and now we need to ask some questions about this church. It took away our sense of ancestry. It took away and stripped away our sense of identity. And so this pandemic is causing the black church to reclaim that. So when we talk about the church, there is not a monolithic church. So those who are listening today, I don't care if you serve in a mostly white church, be very intentional about finding other expressions of ways that we, our church beloved community. There's more than one church. And so um, don't co-op what it means to be church. Be better, do better. That's a good word and a good word of challenge. Thank you for that. And I think that's a that's another gift of this time, right? When all church 
churches, most churches have moved online. You get a chance, we get a chance to experience what church looks like in different forms and different visions that, mm. and that's the thing, you know, I've been trying to seek out in this time in a way I, cause I can, now that I'm not in one place on Sunday, every Sunday, I can with different clicks, watch different ways of being worshiped and engaged in different ways of being worship and, and learn right about our siblings and, and see the differences and the beautiful differences. And I think that's, we've got to be clear. So thank you for that. Uh, we have yeah. our Latina church is Iglesia de Esperanza. And so it's upstairs in this other area, part of the building. So I'll go up there and I get my dance on. Then I come back stairs and I can be all dignified. <laughs> church. So it's wonderful at Northway, right here on Northwest Highway in Dallas, Texas. We having a ball doing it all. So, I love it. Uh -huh. We got a question that we says, um, will you talk about, um, or will we invite you to talk about how to best be an ally? I know many of us have realized, I've realized in this time, I've known for a while that as, as a white person, I, even though I grew up with good people, I grew up in a racist system and I have racist tendencies inside of me and I'm seeking desperately to be anti-racist and to be intentional about that. But I, I heard someone talk about that and say, it's, it's more like, I don't remember who it was, it's more like flossing and less like having your appendix out. It's something you have to do every day and not a one-time thing to become anti-racist. And so how, what are your thoughts? How do you, how can we best be allies? How can we best seek to be anti-racist? And I know that is not fair to ask you who is doing that work and to ask our siblings of color who are doing that work every day that we will do our own research. But, but will you, would you mind obliging us for just a moment with that question that was asked? I probably want to help my white siblings, especially uh, people of color probably already can say that. So I'll say my white siblings, uh, my brothers and sisters, the beloved. One, don't ask black people how they doing because we're not okay. And the ways that we're not okay, we're actually better than we were because now more people know and we are unapologetic and say, I'm not okay. Give me 50 feet, let me breathe. So um, I, if, if you wanna be an ally, you probably just wanna stay away from that question. It's like going to the hospital. <laughs> Someone had, open heart surgery is like, how you doing? I just had open heart surgery. That's how I'm doing, right? You know, so they teach you in pastoral care. Don't ask folks how they doing when they're in the hospital. Because they're not all right. They wouldn't be there. But but, man, but we mean well when we do that, right? So, um, so I'm not okay. I can't speak for every Black person. It's not monolithic. And so I can't even respond to then what it means to be an ally for every Black person. I would just say white people need to talk to white people do some anti-racism work. Look for ways in which you and your individual self can change and then commit to the change for the rest of your life. 401 years, we're not gonna change in this lifetime, but little by little, we will change because one African-American president does not make a change make. So I will say to you um, what I say to um, so many of my dear white brothers and friends, pray and ask God, because the one who made you fearfully and wonderful, the one who knows a word on your tongue, Psalm 139 says, before you say it completely, the one who, if you were to count the number of thoughts, it will be more than the grains of sand. That one will reveal to you if you're quiet enough if you're vulnerable enough, if you bear your soul long enough to don't then think you can then move to another ism, mm -hmm. not the oppression Olympics, but this one right up in here, this, I can't breathe, this in this moment requires for us in this pandemic to deal. We have not dealt honestly and earnestly as the church who Peter gets the keys, right? To bind on heaven and earth, to bind on earth, which is bound in heaven and to loose on earth, which is loose heaven. He gets the key, we got the keys to this. So stick with it. It is not a fad, it's not going away next year. You can't get enough. You go on and commit to this for the next 20 years in each of your churches and then build a plan in 10 years that you gotta revisit this. And so that one day, maybe somebody won't, but 401 years, the, what it took to build it, 
these racist systems, it's going to take longer to undo it. So you might as well, if you're listening, if you can see this, plan on this being your work. You'll have other work to do, for sure. We have ecological justice. We have uh, gender justice. Have, but this justice is on our watch for such a time as this. Thank you. That's, that's our lot work. Yeah, and it is our work. And those of you from Ridgely who are, are listening, I know a lot of you are joined in. We are um, starting our, a book study in the next two weeks of um, raising white kids. So those of us who our call is to, as white folks, is to help other white folks and to learn together. And how do we raise our white kids to do that anti-racist work and raise that next generation? So if you want to join us for that, we'll have, we have information coming out about that as well and how you can join it. We have another question. Let's see. Do you feel today's racial environment is a political leadership issue, a separation of people's understanding issue, or a lack of spirit issue? All of it. I, I'm trying to get what's underneath the question, right? I think it's a human issue. I think that you can't separate, you can't bifurcate all of this stuff. It is deeply dirty. It's messy. And the humus, the dirt of who we are, it's not like physical above, a uh, uh, spirit above and physical. It's not a platonic. We can't approach it that way. It is this dynamic, messy, chaotic, tohu va bohu that, uh, that we talk about in the beginning, how the world was. It's that. So God calling order to that. And so it is politics. And we want to say social gospel and we want to make this some other kind of gospel. It's all of it. And so it is medical, it's educational, it's food, it's spiritual, it's political, it's ecological, it's existential, it's soteriological, I can be whatever word, it's that coal. <laughs> it's all of that. And when we try to stop thinking we can use some empirical data and somehow linearly fix it, but back up long enough day by day to let it reveal and open up. I'm learning more about internalized racism and sexism and the intersections of then how, you know, wherever you fall in the other, other isms that I have more privilege and I exercise that privilege over someone else. I'm not married, so then those who are married are better than me. I am um, a straight uh, Black female, so what does that mean for those who uh, fall somewhere else in the LGBTQ spectrum? So now I have more power than them. I mean, we all got some kind of privilege, but what you do with your privilege matters. So I became my privilege either. I get it. Mm -hmm. But I do with that privilege. That's what matters. I forgot what the question was. I think you answered it. <laughs> you answered it more. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Mark or Catherine or anyone else on Facebook, any additional questions? While we're waiting and seeing on those, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Virgie. Thank you, friend. I cannot. I cannot say thank you enough, not only for joining us tonight, but more than that, for, for the ministry you do in this world each and every day. I am grateful to be a part of the church you are a part of. I am grateful to walk, walk alongside this journey together with you. Thank you for leading our church and for following God and teaching us how to do it. Um, I am forever grateful and I am praying alongside you and working alongside you as we look to do this, this ministry and to take these next steps and to see where the spirit's leading us into that beloved community. So thank you for that. And I can't wait for our next happy hour either to do some of that Ceylon too. It's been good. I just realized I changed my name. I had my old, whole email on here the whole time, but it <laughs> a queen is what my grandchildren call me. And it was the white ministers white youth ministers in Memphis, Tennessee, in that southern, southern city that I love dearly. Um, but a couple of white youth ministers, they started calling me queen, particularly mm -hmm. Dick Lord, who was at the Life Church at the time. And he would, I'd be the only female sometime in the room. And uh, he's like, queen. And there, people are like, well, who is she? And why does he call her queen? But that was his name for me. And so uh, that's my grandchildren's name, and more people call me queen, but there is this sensibility of 
an identity that we are called to rise with new names. And I pray that the newness of who we will be together um, as the beloved will, will also um, be shared as we come through this pandemic in this chaotic time. Thank you, Queen. Mm -hmm. Those of you who are joining us, I, if you have more questions for us about some of the resources she shared with us, put those in the comments. You can come back and like them later, and we will try to help get you those resources um, so you can continue to learn and walk with us next week, next Wednesday night for our, our series, Faith in a Time of Chaos. We will be welcoming my dear friends, Shana and Brahim Oglable. Shana and I went to college together at Trinity University. Um, they are both college work on college staffs or college professors. Shana is Jewish from Texas, from Corpus Christi, and Brahim is Muslim from Morocco. And they will help us walk through what does it look like with our interfaith neighbors, with people who are living out faith in all ways to be faithful people today. So we hope you join us back back then. And, and thank you, Queen. Thank you, Pastor, for being with us. We are so grateful. And thank you for all of you who have joined us for the ways that you live faithful lives each and every day and seek to follow God and follow God's love. We are forever grateful. Have a great night. Blessings.